Hey guys, it's Model Making Time and I'm really glad to be showing you this event that happened on the 15th of January 2023 which is Hurricane, the unsung hero in FX which is at the Imperial War Museum in Duxford. Public events that anyone could have gone if you bought tickets for it and I'm so glad that I did. You can see me there just in the crowd there. Um, but yeah, I really thought this event was incredible, really well put together. So good job to every single person who was involved in it. You can see this hanging here with all the hurricanes surrounding you. There was a spitfire in the corner for you as well. And obviously the big chest just sat up at the very end. But there was the uh, little shop in here as well. So if you did want to buy some goodies, you could do so, including uh, many Airfix kits. And there were, of course, hurricanes available. And I did end up buying myself a hurricane. So I've not actually built the Airfix hurricanes. So I'll have to do that at some point. Now, what is any event without models? And this is the Hurricane SIG. So we've got hurricanes of every variation, some that were like one off. So there's like the Iranian one, which is an open cockpit two seat trainer, which is mad. There's markings that we've seen before that I absolutely adore, like of Regia Aeronautica. And there's Yugoslavian, Romanian, Irish, just pretty much everything here that you could want to build. And hopefully this inspired children to go away and build some. And in fact, FX did have a make and take, so you could make a kit whilst you were there, have your first ever try at modeling, which I think is absolutely fantastic. And it's key to help bring in newer members of the uh, modeling community. You can see the Regia Aeronautica one there and the Irish one following up to some of my favorites. A rule pit here. This one was just absolutely stunning in the all black with the flaps removed so you could see inside the wings of the aircraft. This Romanian scheme I just think is dazzling with its yellow nose. Of course we had the proper hurricane surrounding us as well, which was just absolutely stunning. And there were some other aircraft there as well, which uh, gave you the opportunity to see the lineage of the hurricane and also get some, uh, get some unusual selfies. But of course, we're here for the event and I won't put too much music in the background so that you can hear everything in detail. To start uh, the talk, um, what I actually want to do is have a look at three pilots. But the first one we've got here uh, over on the left hand side is a South African pilot uh, by the name of Marmot Duke Thomas St. John Pattle. There we are, it's not a bad name, is it? Um, now, he was actually the <laughs> scoring RAF pilot to a flown uh, hurricane in his own right. Uh, indeed, in many respects, he's recognised now as the highest scoring British or Commonwealth uh, pilot of the Second World War. Um, there's a slight variation in exactly how accurate that was, partly because of a lot of the records were lost because of where he was operating. This aircraft here is actually a, a 109 uh, that he actually shot down. Uh, so that's one of uh, Pat Pattel's victories, um, uh, which, uh, let's say, Found the, found the photo in the archive, so it's worth having a quick look at. The next guy here is Frank Reginald Carey. Uh, now, he probably scored 26 victories, um, and he was the single highest scoring Hurricane pilot. He claimed every victory on a Hurricane. Now, again, his records are um, a little bit confused in places. He did fly over France, he flew in the Battle of Britain, uh, but later he also flew uh, in the Burma Theatre in the Far East. And it was during his combat in Burma that he added nine victories to his, uh, to his tally against Japanese aircraft. So uh, already we're seeing, you know, where the Hurricane's being used, this diversity, Europe and, and otherwise. Uh, and a couple of these guys already have scored a huge number of victories in Hurricane. Now our third pilot, uh, this is the only image I could find of him in our archive, uh, he's not British, he's not even from the Commonwealth. This is Joseph Frantisek. Now, he was actually a pilot from Czechoslovakia, who, when his homeland was uh, annexed, uh, he escaped, flew with the Polish Air Force, flew with the, free, uh, with the French Air Force until, uh, until France fell, and he found his way across the channel to fly eventually during the Battle of Britain with 303 Polish Squadron. Now, Frantisek here had seen what had been happening in Europe, and he fought with a real uh, passion uh, and a real um, uh, vengeance, let's say. Now, bearing in mind that he only actually sees combat for the first time on the 2nd of September 1940, and he shot down and unfortunately killed on the 8th of October, around about four weeks. In that period, he becomes the highest scoring fighter pilot of the entire Battle of Britain period. 
The aircraft that Francis Schepp was flying uh, is represented by one of the examples out in our exhibition. Uh, this is uh, the example of it flying. Uh, and we can see there the RF RF codes, the 303 squadron. But he was a Czech pilot, so he uh, very, very proudly displayed his Czech uh, national insignia just by his cockpit. Uh, so where did the hurricane begin? Uh, the hurricane came from the Hawker Aircraft Company, but immediately before HG uh, Hawker Engineering was formed uh, during the First World War, the company uh, that it, it came from was called Sopwith. But after the war, Sopwith uh, went into a period of bankruptcy and the company was kind of reformed as HG Hawker Engineering from the assets left over. During the interwar years, they went on to make aircraft like this here, this is the Hawker Fury. But the Hawker Fury uh, kind of epitomized the RAF during the interwar years. This sleek biplane. Yes, it's, uh, it's obviously it's still a biplane, but we've got a lot of metal appearing. Uh, and in the Hendon sort of pageants and otherwise, gloriously polished silver aircraft, you know, uh, wowing by being tied together and doing displays. Um, how effective it might have been in, in actual combat was uh, was never really never really seen. Now here we are, K5083, the first hurricane. When we have a look at this one, we can see a number of differences to the production model. From this angle, we can see a couple of uh, features that don't really appear later on hurricanes. Uh, the folding uh, undercarriage they were actually designed to completely uh, disappear, oh, to completely enclose the tire once it was folded, but that was deleted as a an unnecessary um, complication. On uh, well, this particular one, the uh, tail wheel was also retractable, but again, it was found that uh, that wasn't uh, going to be a lot of use. And the ta they didn't have a lot of uh, confidence in the strength of the tail, so the tails were stabilised, much like the 109 stays stabilised pretty much through its entire life. But again, another, another view of the prototype in flight here, um, with the tail wheel retracted, as you might be able to see at the back. Um, this, the aircraft will go on uh, to aid to service with the RAF with 111 Squadron at RAF North Pole. Now, the airframes are being produced by Hawkers and it gets to a point where there's a few ready. The in-service the in date is due to be January 1938, but they decide to move the time frame up. There's a weather window and they can get the aircraft to North Pole. And in doing so, uh, it means that the Hurricane comes into RAF service in December. 1937. Here we have uh, the picture of uh, V7497, one of the hurricanes that is out in the exhibition. This was while it was under restoration, uh, Hawker restorations. Um, I put this picture in here really just to show how complex it is under the skin. Big notice here is we can see obviously that nice wide hunt, uh, undercarriage on a hurricane and it's fastened to the uh, wing stubs. What that meant is you can take the outer wings off and you can still maneuver it around. So uh, very obviously it was quite an, uh, an easy example of taking those outer wings off uh, and replacing a fabric wing with uh, with a metal wing as we went. I've got a bit of an inverted view here. I'm not quite sure if someone was about to jump out. Uh, very very early hurricanes were very similar to the prototype. That would have been completely smooth. But they found that in certain conditions the rudder gave no authority uh, certainly in various uh, rumbling manoeuvres. So an extra uh, section was built, and you'll see it on all our hurricanes out there, that just extended the lower portion of the fuselage uh, and it gave more control over the rudder. They had to extend the, the tail wheel as well just to, uh, just to give that. So very, very early uh, production hurricanes in the L series would have had fabric wings, two-bladed propellers, and would have had a, a relatively smooth underside at the at the rear of the aircraft. So there we are. Hurricane firing some garments, so it was good. Uh, looks looks good at night, I think, as well. So the Hurricane, when it came into service, uh, much like the Spitfire when it follows, uh, is deemed to require eight 303 Browning machine guns. And the number eight has been created through a number of mathematical equations based on weight of fire. They didn't expect that a monoplane fighter would be able to tangle with an enemy aircraft long enough to be able to fire for prolonged periods like they had in, in sort of biplane dogfights. They expected only to be able to sit behind an enemy aircraft for a couple of seconds. In that couple of seconds, how many bullets do you need to hit the enemy with uh, to be able to have a chance of bringing them down? So this is why the four guns of the Gladiator 
became A in the hurricane. It was purely to give uh, an increase of weight, and I do mean weight, because they weren't explosive shells to start with. Uh, it was about putting as many holes and bits of lead into the enemy aircraft in a short space of time. The advantage that the Hurricane had in some respects over the Spitfire is all the gunners were grouped together, so they were a little lot quicker of being rearmed, there were fewer panels to be removed. Um, with the Spitfire you have to take off uh, eight step foot panels top and bottom, the Hurricane is one panel top and bottom for each bank of guns, so it is uh, a relatively uh, quicker process to rearm. But then we go forwards. Here we've got uh, the eight guns being uh, being maintained, and, but things move forwards with the Mark II, and we find two more machine guns added outboard of those four, and you'll see it represented on two of the aircraft out there. And, and with the Mark II as well, we see uh, an increase from the Merlin III to the Merlin XX. It was a slightly longer engine, uh, so they actually moved the radiator slightly, and the aircraft gave the only increase in length between, let's uh, say, between the Mark I and the Mark II. And the Hurricane, in terms of its development, is a bit easier to talk about than the Spitfire, because there's only really three main production variants of the Hurricane compared to 24 of the Spitfire. With the Mark II uh, and the 2B, they start to attach hard points to the aircraft. These initially are designed to carry light bombs, uh, 100, 125 pound, but easily carrying 250 pound if needed. And unofficially, they start to carry 500 pounds before they're cleared for action. A couple of 20 millimeter cannons. Now, we haven't got an example of a, of a hurricane with the, uh, the cannons out there, but the 20 millimeter cannons allow the hurricane to pack a more, far more significant punch. Unfortunately, they also made the aircraft heavier and slower at a point when the end of the aircraft were getting faster. So the cannons, although they are used in an air-to-air -air role for a short while, they find a bit of a niche when they move over to more ground attack uh, operations. And they become the Mark IIc with the cannons. We then see variants of the Mark II um, start to have an underslung gust. So the 20 millimeter cannons are in this wing, and uh, as you probably see under there, there's a pod to carry of a 40 millimeter gun. Now, of the other British designations, they can be summed up fairly quickly. The two becomes the four. They never really make a three. I think they make two of them, but it does go into production. And the four really becomes what the two is with a bigger, a bigger engine and a bit more armor. The Hurricane, like the Spitfire, would also be adapted to go to sea. Uh, initially, before it starts serving off of uh, the, Ar the Fleet Air Arms of Royal Navy's aircraft carriers, it was adapted for use in this way, um, to be fired from specially adapted uh, merchant or navy ships with a catapult. They were single-use aircraft. They were there purely as um, a deterrent initially, but obviously with a, with a, a role of shooting down uh, long-range German maritime aircraft, more usefully, I suppose, with the addition of catapult sports and arrest of books and otherwise, it became uh, the Sea Hurricane. And the Sea Hurricane uh, is the, it sort of runs parallel to the, to the REF Hurricanes in terms of some of the armament it could carry and otherwise, they could carry machine guns, cannons and otherwise, um, but they were pretty much always employed as a fleet defense fighter by the fleet air arm. Although it stopped being produced in November 1944, it does remain in RAF frontline service as a ground attack aircraft to the end of the war. In fact, uh, in this incident here being used virtually up to sort of, uh, you know, May, June of 1945, um, harrying and attacking the retreating Japanese forces. This aircraft here, PZ-865, was the last Hurricane ever produced. It was rolled out of the Langley factory uh, as the 14,487th Hurricane that was ever built. And amazingly, not only does it still exist, but it still flies with the Battle of Britain Memorial flight at RAF Coningsby. So the, the talk by uh, Liam Shaw never really continued to be developed to in the same way that Hawker's the Spitfire was. Heritage if Hawkers went back the to the drawing board to the, the products other that came options. after, including uh, things them, like the Typhoon, uh, the Tempest, the, the Sea Fury, the Hunter. You know, it just went into everything that they're famous for and ending with the uh, mighty, mighty 
Hawker Harrier. So yeah, it was a really amazing talk and I didn't post everything here. I just sort of cut it down to some of the main details so you could get some indication of the history of, uh, of the hurricane. Of course, I also want to, you know, keep something for people who are at the event and uh, let them be able to enjoy the full of the experience. That's why I've made sure that I've edited everything down, not given absolutely everything away, but given enough to show you how fantastic this event was. And um, honestly, if you see another one of these, I do recommend going. Uh, I mean, for myself, it's a fair drive, but I had a blast. But of course, we weren't just here to listen to Liam Shaw talk about the history of Hawk Aviation and obviously the Hurricane more specifically. We were also here to talk about FX and their relationship with the Hurricane, more specifically about the Hawker Hurricane uh, in 148 scale that they had. So in a moment, I'll let you go through and uh, listen to some of the key points from uh, both a research and design perspective that they went through. Uh, there was another talk after this, which I didn't actually stay for the whole thing of, purely due to time I wanted to have a, another scoot around the museum, but that was actually about uh, finding the GNA um, Hawker Hurricanes missing artwork, and it was a really fascinating talk, and then they talked through sort of the uh, the making and painting of the Hawker Hurricane for um, FX Model World. So that was really, really cool. Unfortunately, I, say, I didn't get the full event, but that can be something that's just kept for everyone who was attending there, right? So without further ado, let's go and have a look at the FX team talking about the development of the 148 scale Hawker Hurricane. Connected with the Hurricane for a long time. Uh, longer than I've been alive, longer than Matt's been alive. So we first released the Hurricane in 1957. Our first aircraft model, and they're tied, so they're totally tied, was the Spitfire. Right, boom. Um, <laughs> but that was the BTK Spitfire, which wasn't actually a mark. So uh, the first proper Spitfire I did was 1958, 1959. So the Hurricane beat it to production in airfix terms, uh, which you know, sort of mirrors the real thing, I suppose is our first proper aircraft model kit we could say you see down here on the bottom left that's taken from the factory of margate that's the original hurricane four mold and uh, they still exist to this day um gathering a few cobwebs at the moment because uh, it's not out in india getting produced uh obviously it's been worn throughout the years hundreds of thousands of bits of plastic have gone through it and over the years it's deteriorated um, and we will like to think hurricane models made today are a lot better um, I hope you agree. We've produced lots of variants of hurricanes at different marks, different uh, scales. And you can see some iconic books out there. Uh, the one that a lot of people will remember from Christmases many years ago is the 24 kits that we did a long, long time ago. And now I'm not about to say, and here's a new one. We're announcing it, oh, though it's not happening, <laughs> sorry to say. Uh, and that 24 kit um, is really quite special in a lot of people's hearts, but it has for all the super kits that we do. This one is the one that really is quite impressive. The, the breakdown of the original 24 kit that uh, shows how complicated it was, it was. And obviously, as with all old draft, they've all done my hat. Someone has spent many, many hours doing that, probably days, maybe weeks. Um, so much so, when me and Matt were drafting our two presentations, we both looked at each other's screen and went, no, I wanted that drawing. Mm. I wanted to do that one. Mm. Um, so we had some fight about it. So it went in the beginning. It's not with anyone's presentation. Um, and that's where we come from. How do we go about selecting things, you know? So the first one is pretty obvious. Are there any really gaps in the market? Uh, we look at release schedule and uh, quite often on a grower range. So you don't want to just do one single World War II fighter. Uh, you want others around it. There are rule breakers. So I put the Swift up on the screen there because well, really you're only going to get one release out of it. And then the previous site was notoriety. They're quite often not going to like the picture in the middle there normally the spit quiet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which I changed for today. Uh, so previous times you look at uh, what people buy normally as many new products uh, and you know, famous aircraft sell. So we always say Spitfire sell, so in the Hurricanes. As a researcher, uh, I've got a few different steps I have to go through to make sure that the product at the end is as accurate as possible. So you want to find it experts. Normally, bottlers are a wealth of knowledge. You also get a few oil chair experts. Part of my job is to uh, sift through who knows their stuff and who thinks they know their stuff. You go through archive material as well. So I, I'm lucky enough to go to places like IWM, 
uh, RAF museum and uh, various museums looking at stuff that hasn't been seen in a, a long, long time. And you want to build a subject library. You want to um, get as many books as you can. I, I love books. Um, and you quite often find that if one book's written it, all the books since have copied that fact. And you'll quite often find it's all made up and you need to challenge what they're saying. Eventually, I have to put this down on paper and brief the design team because otherwise I'm just, just the ramblings of a mad man at that point. Uh, telling the all about uh, fuel filters and stuff and this. Put it on the document, brief me please. Uh, and then sell them if my job done at that point and Matt or any of the designers will go away and start designing. That's where the questions start to creep in. You get um, stuff that you maybe haven't considered going through the base level of data and you really need to delve into certain aspects at that point. And then my favourite bit is the project critique. The designers spent six months pouring their life and soul into a project and you get to rip it apart. It's amazing. <laughs> and they, they hate it. I am, you know, I am a rivet counter. I hate rivet counters. I am one. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, um, quite often that will reveal parts that maybe uh, that's wrong, but why is it wrong? You need to go away and do further research. We get to visit lots of hurricanes and lots of aircraft in general, and you, you start to realise that they are unique. Every aircraft is unique, um, especially when their methods of building are all hand-beaten paddles, etc. Uh, so I mentioned 3D scanning. It's something that, as I mentioned, we haven't built hurricane modelling quite a while now, 2015, I think, for the time. Uh, 3D scanning sort of was coming in around that time, and until recently, we'd never 3D scanned the hurry. Uh, so it's nice to overlay or look at parts of it that we recognise from the old model and uh, it sort of uh, justified what we've done. It's, it's always good. Don't want it looking totally different. Uh, so this one is a Mark One from Finland that we scanned many years ago, uh, which gives the designer Know, great confidence in what they're doing, especially when you're designing purely from drawings in some cases. If you're then able to scan, you can verify what you've done. This part is the one that designers get very, very excited about. I'm talking dangerous levels of excitement. And it looks <laughs> probably the most boring out of all of it. <laughs> um, so offset tables, uh, essentially a big grid of coordinates uh, with sort of an overlay drawing uh, that tells the designer where to plot out points to get kernels and structure of the uh, of the aircraft. After Luke's done his job, it's the right move a lovely uh, pile of information to decipher. Uh, but we start off by really getting to grips with what's going on inside the aircraft or vehicle, whatever uh, they're making. Uh, we use a CAD package uh, called Creo, and this is called Pro Engineer. Um, is really flexible, quite powerful bit of software, um, and it's very good at uh, making the sort of organic curve shapes that we find in aviation. Um, so we can pop that all out to 2D, make sure everything's in the right place, which in turn gives us the opportunity to then expand that into 3D. Um, so you could see where it took the wings behind the scene, we started to get the uh, pick up points to this pilot's seat, tail wheel, because if you don't get that right, the whole aircraft is going to be skewed and distorted, um, and the, the proportions will be wrong. Hurricane, each one of the intersections of all the pipe work is given a, its own uh, letter or number. Um, so that when you go into the individual parts of rinse, you can see, you can see this joint canyon where the uh, pipes um, uh, step this so you can line that up exactly in the fuselage where it needs to be. Once we've got all those uh, sort of base information fake in place, we can then overlay detail drawings. So we're using 2D profiles, uh, arrange them into 3D, and then we can use that to build up the shapes around the, sort of un the underlying uh, framework. The offset tables that Luke was talking about, um, they give you a set of uh, 3D coordinates. Um, but you can see all these dates and points, the little breads crosses, um, where I've plotted out an XYZ coordinate, going back to the Hawker drawings, and that gives me the position of all the uh, stringers. Although the main shape, such as the shape of the wheel, that's all defined by the drawings, there are other areas, such as um, the wing fillets and um, the shape of the fairies around the nose, where the drawings are much more vague. Um, so you go back to using a lot of photographs, first-hand uh, measurements, 
um, because in real life the, the panels would have been formed over formers, they would have been uh, wheeled by hand, um, so the shapes do vary from aircraft to aircraft. So at this stage, because we're making a model kit rather than a full-size aircraft, we're able to think about how thin we could mould things, uh, what our extra parts are going to be moulded in. So process of developing an individual part. So these days I've taken the fuselage half of the one to forty inch scale hurricane kit. Um, so from those, uh, what we call the skeleton model, we then have to convert all of that information into a part that we can use to write talk paths uh, for a CNC machine. So first off, we're literally doing a copy and paste of all the purple surfaces to find all the geometry that we need that relates to that part. And that case gives us this basic grey shape which is near near the finished part, but there's still a lot of refinement to do. Uh, once we've got to this stage, we need to make sure that it's got to mould correctly. So we can check what we call the draft angle. So when you're opening a mould up, everything has to be at a very slight angle so it doesn't get knocked in the, in the tool. All of the surfaces on one side have to be blue, and all of the surfaces on the other side have to be red. The other thing we need to check is that the parts aren't too thick. If, there's, if the plastic's too thick, you get sink parts. If it's too thin, you might get sort of short shots, fits missing, um, so we can check for that, those sorts of issues. The bigger the scale, the more detail we're going into. A little 70 second scale aircraft may already have four or five parts inside a bigger aircraft. Um, we might have 20, 30 parts in the interior. The Hurricane is sort of chunky enough for 40 amps now that you can put um, a really nice uh, cockpit frame that really shows off the sort of internal structure of the aircraft. So on a, on a Hurricane, as I said before, there's a lot of different materials, a lot of different fastenings um, that all add character to the to the airframe. Um, but with strengthening ribs, you've got the fa uh, fabric fa uh, texture of the tail. Um, all, all those details have to be incorporated into the, the base of Capable. Um, so once we've got all our design work finished, uh, we go... Recently we've got a in-house uh, 3D printing system. So we can uh, use it, we've got a resin 3D printer, we can print out whole set parts, we can put them together, make sure it all works okay, make any modifications. Um, but sometimes we've been printing out two or three sets of parts before we're happy with uh, the fine design. So once all that's done, all the design work is sent off to our tool makers. Um, we get quite involved in the design of the tools. Um, we have to take into account how uh, how big the box is, you don't want the frames to be too big to fit in the box. Um, what the estimated cost is, we need to fit in a certain amount of tools to get the production cost where we need it to be. Looking a lot closer at the tool drawings, uh, making sure it's, uh, all the feed gates are in the right place, the eject pins are in the right place. And then during the crisis, the mobile manufacturer, we get updates uh, using a probe um, so we can track that the tools are keeping up to schedule. Once all the bombs have uh, finished off, we have a process of building test shops where we literally get them, sit in the office, uh, get, any, get on everyone's nerves by uh, uh, making the base run of poly cement. <laughs> There's a team of five designers, so we all get a turn to sort of build each other's past comments around, so really a team effort. Especially when we get to the point of doing the instructions where there could be several different ways which you could arrange something. And then we're on to the first proper fully painted builds. Now FX had a really great Q&A at the end. It was quite lengthy, which was great because there were so many questions being asked. Although I think there was a little bit where everyone was like, do I ask the question? You know, that awkward thing the British people are fantastic at doing when no one wants to ask a question for a moment. Yeah, we all did that. But it was honestly, it was full of laughs. It was really, really great. Um, everyone trying to find out what was in the range in the future. People talking about just you know, how long they've been doing the hobby and how they appreciate everything FX has done. It was just really lovely. And it's great to see such amazing engagement between a manufacturer and its community. And I think it's something that FX is really excelling at, especially over some other brands who are perhaps less engaged with the community. And I mean, FX probably wasn't always that great with engagement, but they're definitely on top of their game now. They're like slaying this. So let's hope they always maintain that crown. Now I've cut some of the 
the funniest bits and some of the questions that I really enjoyed for you to listen to but obviously there was much much more to be had uh, including a lot of people were just trying to find out if they could get their favourite model made. <laughs> I have no plans for a 24 Hurricane yet. yet. <laughs> <laughs> and who? <here. laughs> Luke, what are you researching at the moment? No, I've tried. <laughs> 124 scale hurricane. No, you're right. <laughs> um, hi there, first of all, thank you very much to you and your colleagues who have kept me entertained for many years. I'm on my very joy. Let's at the front. Not to pin the downer on this. Oh, <laughs> lovely length. Are you getting pressured by the eco groups and that? to change the way you do plastic kits or to make it less um, you know, sustainable? Um, no, we're not getting pressure, but we are, as consumers ourselves, we are very aware of it. So if you look at our brand new Spitfire kit, the 124 scale kit, um, the, the packaging is sourced from sustainable sources. Um, we've used less plastic inside um, as well, so not everything's in plastic bags, there's paper uh, that divides certain bits of yeah. um, frames in there as well. There's more work to be done, um, but it's, it's a long term thing that we just need to have to try and move over to. to. Um, in terms of changing the actual plastic, that's a very different thing, um, because we have to consider the types of glue and everything else, and that's a lot of a whole industry change. Uh, and that's not going to happen for, for a long time, if ever, if ever. The reason I left this question in is because it's something I've actually thought about quite a lot as well. And it's good to hear that ethics really are, you know, conscious of the environmental impact of this hobby. It's not the most environmentally friendly hobby. We all know that. We all participate in it because we love the hobby. And, you know, it's something that will hopefully change in the future as technologies develop. But it was really good to see ethics taking a good stance on that. <laughs> Given world events, is that going to drive models, for example, things that are using Ukrainian Air 2072s? Um, it, it likely will with other manufacturers. Um, we don't like what we're seeing at all. I can't imagine anyone does. Um, we've, we're making a conscious effort not to not to do anything. Um, we don't like to chase. Um, modern subject or modern conflict. We, do, we just don't feel it's right, um, which is why we, you won't see anything on our social media about that or uh, any connected subject to you know, what's being shipped out there this week or, or whatever. So we just, you won't see anything from, that, uh, from us on, on that. And you certainly won't see any product uh, anytime soon on it. I also thought this was a really interesting closing thought for me to leave this on because we've seen some manufacturers sort of do it as a, a sign of like pride I guess for supporting Ukraine and others have sort of just avoided the subject entirely and it was I guess refreshing to hear a manufacturer still openly talk about it, still respond to a question about it but just say actually this isn't for us, we don't feel comfortable with it and so we're just not going to. So it's good to see that, you know, that open discourse can be had. And I say, it's really good to see this level of transparency from any company, let alone a brand as cherished as FX. As usual, thank you to all my channel members, regardless of what level you are, I really appreciate you. We've got some new starter kits joining today, with Captain BFC, and we've also got Tora the Explorer, and we've got a new advanced kit of Crazy Loka, who joins explosive order. And uh, just because I feel awkward not saying everyone, obviously we've still got Mars here as a starter kit as well. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and make sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell to be notified of my new videos and maybe watch this recommended video. YouTube picked it just for you, honey. Watch out for my new videos every Monday and have fun modeling. <laughs>